Uh, right after I asked Dr. Mistler that question, our Skype connection cut out. Sounds kind of mysterious, but I think it was just another one of those technical difficulties I was talking about. But anyway, here we go with uh, part two, and it's just going to continue right here. It's an audio interview, but I've put up some video and, and pictures. It's a great visual treat for you guys to watch. As, as long as I've got you here, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, remembering my wife and uh, praying for her, sending her good thoughts, and for the donations that have been sent. Almost got enough for a recliner. Uh, for those of you that don't know, she's battling uh, stage four metastatic, metastatic colorectal cancer. It's, uh, it's gonna be a hard fight, but she's tough. And uh, anyway, I'm going to keep most of uh, the personal stuff out of these future videos. Maybe I'll put something on the blog or whatever because uh, this is for news. I'm going to try to keep the two things separate. Anyway, here we go with part two of that interview with Dr. Chuck Missler. Enjoy. Don't forget to click on the ads. It's very important. That'll help us raise some, some money to, uh, to fight this cancer battle too. Hello. Okay. Now, uh, that's better. <laughs> Okay, so much for technology, right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes it can be your best friend, and other times it can just bite you in the butt. <clears throat> <laughs> right. Yep, yep, yep. I, and one thing, uh, when you, I don't know if you've read uh, Dante's Inferno or the Divine Comedy or whatever, but I think the, 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 that Dante f failed a, to, to have a compartment in hell with a Microsoft label on it. There you go. I've never had any problems with, like I've had with Microsoft machines. But uh, okay, well, well, the point that forget. I was getting to with the secret societies and, and ancient knowledge is, you know, the thing that I like about you, Doc, or Chuck, is that uh, you're a man of faith that can also understand that science can't be denied. And... Well, let's, you know, let's, let's make a distinction. I think it's very useful to make a distinction between science and technology. Right. Technology validates itself by producing useful products. Technology has really served our way of life very handsomely, whether on this radar, uh, microsite, whatever. Science has become a priesthood, and it has a uh, – and it uh, – it has a, uh, a you know a creed, and if you're going to pursue a, a career in science, you've got to be very very cautious, not to embrace a heresy, such as evolution. There are all kinds of things that we know are not true, but unless you embrace them, you find yourself career limited in science because it's a religion. It's not empirically validated. In early years, it leaned heavily on empirical, you know, verification, validation. But in in uh, in, uh, in recent politics, it's a whole different world. And unless you recognize that it's really a a a, a priesthood, a religion, more than it, is, it, 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 it and it has its own mores and its own uh, uh, fence posts, if you will, uh, it's it's pretty it's it's it's. There's a big in my mind. There's a big distinction between a a viable technologist, whether it's in physics or whatever, um, and uh, and people who call themselves scientists, but then spend most of their time uh, fighting the politics of peer-reviewed journals, which substitute for uh, empirical validation of a hypothesis. Right. And well, so, my my so, point was kind of that. Uh... You know, if you can reproduce something in a laboratory, then obviously it's a fact, it's proven. And uh, carbon fourteen has has been pretty accurate, hasn't it? And the well, it oh no, be careful with that one because carbon carbon fourteen depends on a number of assumptions, which in the limit in 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 uh, in it in, in the spread of, it depends on what magnitude you're talking about. As you go back in time the accumulation of the assumptions start to get to you. So reliable labs won't date carbon-14 beyond a, a few thousand years. And uh, uh, the, the whole issue 
of the fabric of space and the fact that the, the speed of light has been slowing down uh, uh, really blows out the, the many of the traditional yardsticks. One of the things that's really worth looking into, if one hasn't done it yet, is to hear what the plasma physicists have to say about the, our galaxies. One of the things that is really astonishing is to realize that the plasma physicists have been trying to tell us this for years, and nobody's been listening. That the, Gal the, the uh, Newton's law of gravity is fabulous in terms of the solar system and those distances and masses. But when you start going out in light years and so forth, you quickly discover by just doing the math uh, that the distances you know, obviously get squared and that they're the denominator of the equations for uh, gravity, uh, th that they, gravity becomes de minimis when you're talking about galactic distances. In contrast to that, the, uh, the uh, James Clark Maxwell equations um, overrule gravity by a factor of 10 with 36 zeros after it. And so, and in both directions, attraction and, and repulsion. So the people who understand plasmas have a whole different perspective of the galaxies. They're electrical. It's an electrical universe. It's not a gravitationally driven universe. And it's amazing when you get into the technologies here, the, the uh, plasma physicists have said that for more than a generation, but no one's listening. And, so uh, when uh, when a, a site like uh, Globeki Tepe uh, in Turkey or Yonaguni in Japan, these ancient cities that have been dated to past 12,000 years old, you, so when when those are, are dated by science, that's not correct. They well, it, it, you have to make, you have to really analyze the assumptions that go into the dating mechanics, and carbon 14 is and and, and similar techniques are based on assumptions that need to be challenged in terms of the magnitudes we're dealing with. Uh, these, 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 uh, these hypotheses that they're built on have domains of validity. They're not necessarily valid for the full spectrum of distances that you may be trying to apply them to because of, you know, of the accumulation of errors. It's what, a, what an engineer would call a tolerance stack up, if you will. And so uh, that's the whole technical discussion to get into. But the first point is the plasma physicists can create in the laboratory the very phenomenon that we see in the spiral nebula and so forth, the things that we observe in, uh, in astronomy. The astronomers have been excessively preoccupied with gravity as a presumption. And when you do the math, it doesn't compute. So uh, there's a great book out by Donald... God, I think his name was, uh, called The Electric Sky. It's very readable. It's very competent. He's not a Christian. Don't misunderstand me. But he, he certainly punctures most of what uh, we've learned in college about astronomy and uh, with, with empirically verifiable issues. So that's, that's one of the reasons we, uh, science, true science, uh, is very, very supportive of our biblical pers uh, perspective. And that comes as a surprise to many Christians because they've been mistaught. They're not only biblically illiterate, that's part of the problem, but also they've been mistaught by what masquerades as science in the, in the high school and, and, and even college classrooms. Uh, things like the nebular hypothesis, which is still taught in most colleges, has been disproven long ago. Evolution is recognized even by many evolutionists as no longer a satisfactory explanation what we've discovered about our, about our environment. And yet they're still taught, and they're still, they still becomes, they become cornerstones of the fabric of our society. And yet the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 they no longer are regarded by knowledgeable people, they're no longer regarded as being supportable hypotheses anymore. And yeah. so, uh, so one, of the th one of the things that uh, uh, is a fact of our life today is if you peel the onion and really get into the real frontiers of science, you discover that they're very supportive of the biblical perspective. In fact, the most recent uh, buzz going on has to do with the holographic universe. There's a guy by the name of David Bohm. He was a, a confederate of uh, Einstein. He was one of the contributors of the Manhattan Project. Uh, he came into Princeton from the plasma world, actually. He and Einstein were buddies. But anyway, Bohm was fascinated with plasmas and their peculiar behavior. 
and he came to he hypothesized the possibility that the universe may be some kind of super hologram. Now, no one took him, and only a few people took him seriously back then. But what's fascinating is there's a project in Germany called the GEO 600, in, in, which is trying to uh, search for gravitons. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a trying to, to it's, a, they're, it's a mechanic we're trying to use to to verify the possibility of gravity waves, and in trying to make it work, um, it uh, uh, they encounter a kind of noise. And one of the key people at Fermilab wrote them a letter, and it's, it's a lot of it's generated a lot of discussion because it's possible that the noise that they've encountered may be evidence of a holographic universe. And so these ideas of David Bohm uh, are starting to uh, to surface again um, among the people that are really you know, tracking this area, and uh, it's pretty interesting because it may be. You see, the thing that's interesting about a hologram is that perceived distances in a hologram are synthetic, they're not real. And if, if the universe, what may be real, what we think are dimensions may not be the dimensions we think they are. So there's, wow. a, there's, a, there's a whole... <laughs> that, uh, that's pretty deep. It's kind of hard to wrap my head around that. Okay, well, uh, and, and, and obviously these things are still speculative. But what's fascinating is whether you're looking at the macrocosm, that is the the largeness of the universe. You discover the big discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite. It's not infinite. It may be expanding, but it's finite. That was the big discovery. In fact, the fact that it is uh, uh, finite and the fact that we now know it had a beginning is what led to all the speculations, uh, uh, the, the various models they call the Big Bang models. And none of them are quite satisfactory, but that, that's, the, that's the struggle because they know the universe had a beginning. Right. And so, it is finite. Uh, now, you go the other way. Now, you go the other way into smallness, into the macrocosm. That plunges you into particle physics, and you discover there's a limit to smallness. If you take subatomic particles, whether photons or electrons, you discover that if you try to divide them beyond the Planck, li the Planck limit, uh, they lose a property called locality. And this has been verified in the laboratory that all photons somehow know what all other photons are doing throughout the universe. They lose a property called locality. Now, when you stand back from this picture that science has given us, we know that there's a finiteness of largeness on the upside. There's also a finiteness to smallness. And what you discover is that you and I, what we think of as physical reality, is actually a digital virtual simulation that uh, it can, it's composed of indivisible units called quanta. That's why they call the study of that quantum physics. But the point is, there uh, uh, in Scientific American, in June of 2005, there was an article that dealt with the issues that scientists are concerned because they're discovering the so-called constants of physics are changing. And uh, they believe they are. It's hard to test. But You mentioned that. that the speed of light is decreasing. How, how is that happening? How do they, is that confirmed? Is that oh, being... yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 Barry Setterfield uh, published this back 20 years ago. And I had guys like Hugh Ross and some other friends of mine try to talk me into not, in not promoting that because he's obviously a crackpot, what have you. That was their view. It turned out he's been, it's been verified. No, the speed of light, the, 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 the speed of light has been slowing down. And uh, the, the Alan Montgomery in Canada has even built the model. He thinks it's a cosecant squared model. It's becoming asymptotic, obviously, to a very specific number. But the point is that if you go back uh, in all the measurements of the speed of light through history, uh, the, the, uh, obviously the, media, the uh, dispersions get better and better as we get better technology. But what's fascinating is you go through the data, you discover the medians are moving in, in the direction of, uh, of slower. And so the, uh, the, it, it was one of the big shots. That was a big buzz here 10 years ago. But in recent years, it's been well established. But the point of it all is, more to the point, if the constants of physics, and there's others that are changing, if the constants of physics are changing, I'll quote from the Scientific American article, that implies that our reality is a subset of a larger reality. And so if we call the largeness the, ma the macrocosm and we call the smallness, the, you know, things smaller than that, the microcosm, the two of them together are embraced by something larger, which for lack of another term, we'll call the metacosm. 
And that's the domain of where apparently the UFOs traffic. That's apparently the, the domain of angels. That's the domain of who knows what else. The, paranor the things that we regard as paranormal phenomenon uh, may be uh, uh, ex um, uh, we're also dealing here suddenly when we talk about this we're including hyperspaces that is uh, that's simply a word for the uh, uh, spaces of more than three dimensions and uh, the current thinking among informed scientists is that we live in ten, at least ten dimensions maybe more but at least ten four of them are directly perceptible length width of three dimension three spatial dimensions that we call Euclidean geometry plus a fourth that Einstein discovered, namely time. A physicist doesn't speak of space and time separately. He always speaks of space-time because we live in a four-dimensional continuum. That was his great discovery. That was the significance of the 1915 general theory of uh, Dr. Einstein. Well, it, uh, after him came Kaluza Klein that demonstrated that, it's four, that if you go to four or five dimensions, and then Yang Mills about, uh, I forgot, 83, uh, that current thinking from about 1984 on, is what they call the string theory, the idea that uh, there's at least 10 dimensions and, and uh, only four of them are directly perceptible. Right. The so others... it's your contention then that UFOs, what we see as three-dimensional beings, are extra-dimensional objects or beings that are... Or they're, either that or, they're tra or it's a trans-dimensional transfer. In other words, they may be in, a, in a, an environment that is uh, a superset of the environment that we we were in, we do know that there are classified studies. There is uh, one classified study that I happened to encounter uh, that uh, of 432 uh, cases where multiple UFOs demonstrate that they're form in formation flying. In other words, the conclusion that came from the study is that they're uh, they're sent they're controlled they're, they're not natural phenomenon. They are controlled by uh, 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 they're piloted, in other words, uh, because they, they they indulge in what appears to be formational flying. There was, uh, there's been over 3,000 photographs or records that have been authenticated that are part of a classified study. 430 of those, as I recall, were uh, specifically selected because they they impinged on the hypothesis that they were uh, uh, knowledgeably flying in a formation of some kind. And uh, so the point is these things have been the subject of classified studies. Yeah, so how do was, UFOs relate to the subject of Nephilim, the the uh, Well, that's a speculation. Now, that's God a, and man. Now, that's a speculation. Uh, we start that we we study Nephilim uh, from the scripture from Genesis 6, Numbers 13. Uh, they show up when when, uh, when Moses sends the spies into the, into the land and the 10 come back terrified because they were uh, Numbers 13, verse 33 speaks. There were Nephilim in the land then, so they did. They they occurred before the flood. They were the cause of the Noah's flood, but also after that, there's there there's they, we encounter them in the biblical text. Now the reason this becomes a topic of eschatology is because Jesus made the strange remark that as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, in order to understand what he meant, you need to understand what the days of Noah were really all about. And not the only thing, but one of the things that characterized those days, apparently, were the the, uh, the strange goings on between the falling angels to create the, the, the creation of hybrids by the fallen angels, and uh, that's not a speculation that was confirmed three times in the New Testament. Uh, now you view. said that uh, the fallen angels cannot reproduce. So no, I never said that. By I never said that. I never said. Let me back up a second. Angels don't normally reproduce. Don't misunderstand me. We notice that in the scripture they're always masculine. Remember that in in Genesis 19, when the the uh, the two angels visited Lot, it was the homosexuals of the city that wanted to get at them. Right. And I I, I don't have to draw. I don't have to go beyond. I mean I don't want to get into all of that right here. The point is, uh, there is a misunderstood verse where Jesus says the angels in heaven don't marry. Because the angels don't normally reproduce, that says nothing. That doesn't. That does not deal with the issue of what fallen angels might try to do if engaged in mischief. And so, uh, those are two different subjects. And many people, uh, re many 
uh, people superficially reject Genesis, the, the angel view of Genesis 6 because of that remark. But you can't escape the fact when you really study the text that in Genesis 6, we have fallen angels that somehow give rise to hybrids called the Nephilim. The, the, distinguished between the fallen angels and this hybrid offspring, but where they where they where they in, indulge with uh, uh, you know uh, human women and produce the Hagibarim, the the uh, the Nephilim. Now the point is that's a pretty spooky area and is not taught strangely in many seminary, semin, seminaries. But uh, uh, if you study the text and the New Testament confirmation of it, which occurs in Second Peter two and and the Epistle of Jude and several other places. Uh, you can't escape the reality that the Bible, the biblical perspective, is that we've got fallen angels that were indulging mischief and subject to specific judgments because of that, and that's what Jude and Second Peter both confirm. But uh, what I'm so getting are at is fallen angels so, creating Nephilim yeah. again today. Is when now, you fallen, say it. well, it, it, that's that's that is the inference that one would draw. Now. The whether or not this has anything to do with you to do with UFOs is strictly speculation. However, it's interesting that as you get into the study of the UFOs, you've got a real, a huge problem, because they obviously they're obviously physical. They leave evidence behind: radioactivity, burnt ground, and and so forth. Uh, on the one hand, so they're tangible. They're not. Uh, they're also seen simultaneously on multiple radars. So they have a tangibility of some kind. It isn't somebody's hysteria, right? As I'm trying to point out. On the other hand, they violate physical laws. They make right angle turns at, ex at extreme speeds. They go faster than the speed of sound without sonic booms. And there's a number of things that they appear to do that are physically impossible. And there's the paradox, because on the one hand, there's evidence of the reality. On the other hand, there is uh, evidence of behavior that violates our understanding of physics and so that's 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 the that's the paradox you plunge into trying to study what we think we know about them and uh, last week i spoke with author patrick heron he wrote a book called the nephilim and the pyramids of the apocalypse and it's his contention that the nephilim being these uh giant men uh were responsible for building the pyramid there's, it's a widely held belief. Uh, there are a lot of people who've studied that that have that view. Not all the pyramids, the the, uh, the pre-flood pyramids, that the the Great Pyramid are very they're distinct in their architecture that the Egyptians didn't realize when they were later. It, 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 there's a whole study there. David Roll and some of his work and and others have uh, have gotten into the Egypt side of all that. But that's right. The the the, mist, the, <laughs> the more you study it, the more mysteries that emerge. Uh, as you study the details of the Great Pyramid, but, but uh, so he, he may have something there. Uh, how, whether or not there was a connection, that's speculative, of course. But there's some very strange mathematical consistencies between the pyramid designs and Stonehenge. That's yeah, another. I've noticed. I've, I've but been doing some research on that lately, and incorporated into the pyramid are are pi. And and you know half the radius and uh, even the speed of light is incorporated into the pyramid. So yeah, the, that's, yeah the, the the mysteries are, that surround the pyramids are uh, they, they grow and grow and grow and, and it's it is a fascinating study. But 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 at the same time, I don't think anyone has got any supportive uh, you know some uh, supportive conclusions. Uh, there's some very interesting speculations. But because the evidence is suggestive, not conclusive, and so it's a it's a tricky area to research. But uh, the possibility that there's a link between those ancient monuments, such as the pyramids, uh, and the uh, the the uh, prehistory of the planet Earth, uh, I'll call it that. You know, the, the first eleven chapters of Genesis are very very fruitful ground for speculation. All right, so. We've got uh, not much time left. You know, Christ tells us that we can know the season of his return. Right. We can't know the day or the hour. Well, from my perspective, Chuck, it's late fall. Well, and you probably know about the Mayan calendar then. I, I do. And the Sebe the, 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 the Mayan, calendar, the Mayan calendar has a 45-day error in it. Did you know that? 
Uh, no, I didn't. That's news. Okay. I, 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 in the Mayan calendar, uh, uh, apparently predicts that the world comes to an end uh, December 21st of the year 2012. And that's got a lot of visibility. What most people have overlooked is the possibility that there's a 45-day error in that calendar. That is not the 21st. It's the second Tuesday of November that the world comes to an end. And, of course, if you've picked up what I'm, I'm kidding here, of course, my tongue and my cheek, that's the date of our, ele- uh, our federal election. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one, Chuck. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you've heard about this. Did you know that there was a, a Muslim, an illegal alien, and a Marxist that entered a bar? And, and the bartender, bartender said, Hi, bartender said what, would you, what would you like, Mr. President? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That, that whole uh, subject is, is fruitful for another, for another time. But uh, <laughs> what, what, we've, what we've got going on this year, we've got uh, signs in the heavens. Uh, the tetragametron appeared in the sun recently. It was just – it was basically a uh, uh, large – triangular shaped sunspot but i've looked at the pictures of the jewish tetragrammatron and superimposed and it's basically the eye of god and that's a sign to me uh ellen was a sign it didn't really do anything but well was- rabbi khan rabbi khan has a book out called the harbinger and it's pretty it's a, I'm, he may be making too much of it but i think it's pretty fascinating uh isaiah uh 9 10 is a verse that was quoted by three different officials regarding the the Twin Towers coming down. Right. Uh, I and, remember that. They all quote that verse. You know, the bricks are the, 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 the bricks are falling down, but we're going to build build them up with hewn stone. Uh, the sycamore is falling down. We're going to replace it with cedars. They quote that verse as if it's a bounce back. We're going to take charge and go forward. They don't realize that that verse is specifically in context there, a rebellion of Israel against God's warning that the judgment's coming. Right. And, uh, and they, they're quoting it out of context, and they don't realize the context that they're drawing it from is exactly the context that may be going on, namely that the Tower of experience there was specifically a wake-up call from God, and the response is repentance not defiance. And uh, the expression in Isaiah uh, 9.10 is actually an expression of defiance in lieu of the repentance that should be there. And that really <laughs> describes America. Uh, the, you know, what really shocks me, uh, I'm, I, I'm in a second career, journalistic here, if you will. I, I had a, a, you know, a technology career for over 30 years in, in the corporate boardrooms and so forth. Uh, as I look back, uh, and I spent a good bit of, you know, when other guys were in college, I was passing in review on Warden Field at the Naval Academy. I, 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 I took my commission, I graduated with honors, took my commission in the Air Force. After the Air Force, I was in the in intelligence community, in the think tank world, and I spent a good part of my executive career, as I say, in, in high technology, publicly traded companies. So what I'm getting, what I'm getting at is, um, as I stand back, looking back, at my my life, if you will, I'm shocked to perceive the degree of corruption that occurs throughout our society. And I don't mean just the executive branch of the government, although that's where I'd start. I'm talking about the legislature. We have a legislature that signs bills they don't read. We've got a judiciary that is is uh, astonishingly corrupt in many ways. Um, you look at the schools. And they are deliver the, the the they are deliberately dumbing down for several generations now. I used to think that was bad management. I now realize no, that's the agenda. And right. My I, teacher, uh, my that, son's that, teacher, that, told me that no child left behind was the worst thing that's ever happened to education. Well, it'll, it'll certainly make the finals, but there's a lot of other things. The, the, the other thing is that the uh, the entertainment media and the press, the free press, there's not a free press in this country. Tell me and when about you start it. looking at the corruption of the press, the prostitution of the press, you look at the corruption in every sector of society, it's astonishing to see the, the decay of morality 
in various forms. Um, you know, even Wall Street used to be my word is my bond. They were guys that may not be saved theologically, but they're guys that guarded their reputation as their primary asset. I, I lived in that world for 30 years. I now look back, and uh, about to, about 20 years ago, I, I prior in a sense, but one day uh, is I, I I look at Wall Street today, and I'm just astonished at the corruption, the deceit. Um, most of the dumb people that you see in in the, in the talking heads should be in prison, not not being elected to office. And so, um, it's a, it's it's a, a, I, I think America one of the most difficult difficult assessments in from my chair is to figure out, is it too late? The uh, hand that wrath of God has already been. I think America is in far deeper trouble than most people have any idea. And uh, uh, and uh, a different yardstick to that. But probably the simplest one is just to look at the vocabulary. Right. We have a new word in our vocabulary called trillion. Now, Bobby, if I owed you some money and I told you I was going to, I will pay you in one, what I owe you in one million seconds, you'd grab your calculator out and you'd discover that's 12 days. You can handle that. And I'd say, whoops, excuse me, Bob, I misspoke. I didn't, I won't pay in a million seconds. I will pay you in a billion seconds. You get your calculator out and you, and you discover that's 32 years. That's, that's just a quantitative difference. That's a qualitative difference. And then when I go the third time and say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'll pay you back in a trillion seconds, that's 32,000 years. Now, let, right. let that sink in. You go from million to billion to trillion. You're going in seconds. You're talking 12 days, 32 years to 32,000 years. And if so, the point is suddenly realize that these the interest numbers, builds up, Chuck. But what? The interest builds up. So well, it's not just interest. <laughs> that the, the, the magnitude here is so gigantic, it's you can't grasp it. I can't. I haven't found a congressman or senator that can explain to me what a trillion is. If you and I went into business the day that Christ was born, and our business lost one million dollars per day, we would not run up. A uh, uh, trillion dollars in debt until the year two seven three seven. Right. In other words, these numbers are so gigantic, they go beyond uh, any kind of extrapolation. And right. so the the point is, we're now we have an economy here of about fifteen trillion a year, that's saddled with several hundred trillion of debt. That goes beyond our grandchildren, our great grandchildren to ever pay that off. No, that can never be paid off with any legitimate form of currency. And so we're facing here a collapse of the whole structure. And then you start peeling that onion and you discover it's not accidental. It's been designed. There's a deliberate attempt by an elitist power group, call it what you will, that to, to crush America, to get it out of the way because it's viewed as an obstacle towards a, glo a form of global totalitarianism that some people think is a utopia. Right. That yeah. brings me to an interesting point. In uh, in prophecy, it says the oh mystery Babylon in one hour ha has thy judgment come, and a lot of people have said that uh, that's wrong. Uh, but there's also a school of thought that says that uh, mystery Babylon is the United States, which is why it doesn't really appear in end time prophecy. Well, that's a whole study. I don't. I don't happen to equate mystery Babylon with the United States for a lot of reasons. But that's neither here nor there. I'm running out of time on my end, so I hope you've got your got this chat. This uh, chat is useful for you, but I happen to be late for another meeting at this point because it's almost actually. Two it it was great, Chuck. I, I thank you for taking the time to appear on the show. If uh, if it's okay, you know, at some point in the future, I'd like to talk to you again. I'm sure. Okay, that, that, you bet. Yeah. I appreciate. It. Sorry, we had to, uh, problems with the bandwidth. Hey, it I, happens. I appreciate what you're doing, and and uh, the main thing is to keep, the, keep our focus on the coming king. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a monarchist, and I'm a, I'm, I'm serving a king who's coming, and uh, yes, I, applaud, I applaud your commitment to him. And I trust that uh, this, this all may have some utility here, my friend. Thank you very much, Chuck. Okay, I appreciate God. God it. Have a good day. Okay.